This is Common Knowledge, a Magic the Gathering podcast about improving at the game with a focus on proper play. It's not about the cost, it's about the knowledge. Welcome to Common Knowledge. Here are your hosts, Brandon Clark and Lobert. Enjoy this week's episode of Common Knowledge. Hello everyone. Welcome to episode 21 of the Common Knowledge podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Clark, and join with me is the lavish Sean the Lobbert. A British accent? I don't know. Well, I, I think... was going. I was going for the Australian rock from uh, uh, Gar- uh, from Thor Ragnarok, and I don't think I. I don't think I got it. I didn't see Ragnarok. <laughs> S- nerd. S- skip straight to the Avengers Infinity War movie. Oh, did you watch it? Yep. <gasps> Things happen. <sighs> that movie was pretty good. I liked it quite a bit. I, I did too. Like Thanos is the man. I I'm all. I can't. You can't really talk does. about that movie without spoiling anything. So no, we can't. But I am gonna say Thanos is my man. Yeah, he, I'm behind him. You're like on board with his plan. I'm on board. Wow. I mean, I I like him because like he has a real motivation that makes sense. So I, I love him. Spoilers. No, no spoilers. I'm just joking. I think he. Yeah, I, I was. I think he was just a very compelling villain, and uh, it made for it made for entertaining television movie going experience. You know. It did, yeah. It was cool. Yeah, I watched that movie this weekend, and then uh, on Friday night. And then on Saturday, my wife and I just watched Marvel movies the whole day. And like Sunday, we also just did the same thing. <laughs> okay, so basically what just happened is me and Sean talked about Infinity War for like five minutes. And uh, this isn't a podcast about that. So we're cutting it all out. <laughs> so... Check out our sponsor, PureMTGO.com, for all the great things that are great about Magic Online, deck lists and articles and fun times. And you should also do another thing. What is that other thing, Sean? What should they do? I assume you're talking about our Patreon? I don't know where I'm going with this. I was hoping you'd help me. But yeah, Patreon. Yeah. Uh, Talk about it. Go to Patreon.com forward slash common knowledge and donate to, to us if you find any value in our show. We really appreciate it and it helps keep the lights on yeah and we are also we've got some fun stuff in the works for our patrons i really Things just have to fun. figure out how to post that to the patreon because we have yeah, the content we do we're making a lot of mediocre content for <laughs> you guys <laughs> <laughs> sean plays wacky brews and i misclick on magic online and rage quit yeah, we listen to Biggie Small's Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best video ever. So, uh, let's finish out the intro. Uh, we're, on the construct- we're on the constructed... We're on the Constructed oh, Criticism Network. Uh, check out Constructed Criticism and Limited Time Only, hosted by Spencer Howland. They're great. Like They're always teaching you how to improve on the game, and yeah. that applies to all formats. So yeah. feel free to well, check them out. I mean, limited Time Only is, you know, Limited Only. It's literally the title of the show. So. Oh, I've, I've only listened to Constructed Criticism because I don't play Limited. <laughs> You couldn't infer from the title of the podcast that it was about limited. Yeah, I did, and then then I didn't listen to it because oh. I just don't play limited. Limited's fun. You should play limited. Mm, no, okay. Well. It's like popper. Only sometimes you get rares. I play legacy. Like I, I like constructed. I know, like knowing my deck better than anyone and winning based on that. I like winning because I open lucky sealed pools. Okay. We got an email from a listener, Matthew. And uh, he just gave us some fun feedback about our set review show. He listened to it and he enjoyed it. But 
uh, he felt like he would like to vote for us only discussing the top five in each color or whittling it down to top 50. Yeah, and I think, what do you think? I think our consensus was uh, we, we're going to cover, like, we'll, I'll go through, well, we'll go through and pick out cards that we think are significant. We'll talk about those, and then we'll still do our top whatever picks at yeah. the end of the show. Yeah, and so we'll go into a little bit deeper. We'll do our sort of our you know what what all the cards that we think are worth touching on. Um, I called them honorable mentions, and Sean doesn't like that word, so I'm not going to use it. Yeah, because but... that that implies that there's like a top list, and they didn't make it. But we're going to talk about those. But there is a those... top list. But we're going to talk about those. I feel like are aren't we going to talk about those cards in the list, and then no, we'll talk about back them around? in our top five. When we get to our top five, we'll talk about them there. Okay, we're going to have to arm wrestle about this off show. <laughs> Me and Sean can't agree on how our set reviews are going to go, so our next set review is probably just going to be a skawampus mess. No. More so than our last set review was. But anyway, yeah. Um, basically, we felt like, for one, the show was very long, and uh, for two, we had to spend time on cards that are probably irrelevant. Cards that'll never see play and that don't matter. And that took away from the amount of time that we could touch on relevant things. And so we're going to kind of cut out all that fluff and really streamline the show and focus on the cards that matter and the cards that will be impactful in the format uh, or that we think that we think will be impactful in the format, I should say, and, and try to fill it with more value than just this card is a three, two for four. Don't play it. Yeah, it took away from the passion I had about the new cards when I have to talk about the worst of the new cards. Well, yeah, and we saved our, our top five list for very last, at which point I feel like it got to the point where it was like our show had been going forever. Yeah, and we, we got to our we got to our top five and it was like, okay, we gotta do this in like we've got like thirty seconds yeah. each for one of our spots and we breezed through it in like eight minutes and I don't think that is yeah. Ma I don't think that's good radio. Matthew t touches on someone did a Forrest Gump pr impression that neither of us remember who it was because we were just losing our minds by that point. I think it's Brandon. I think it was both of us. I think I feel was... like I remember both of us talking Forrest Gump to each other for like five <laughs> minutes. But I have yeah, no idea. This th this whole thing was just a shady blur. I can't take responsibility for things I said or didn't say in this episode because I don't remember. Anyway, thank you for the email, Matthew. Yeah, uh, we appreciate your feedback. And thank you for, for listening. It's awesome. It blows my mind every time someone is like, hey, I listened to your show and I enjoyed it. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> it just feels very good. Yeah. And um, yeah, it makes it all worth it. Definitely. And I'm doing something that someone found value in. Are cool. Are ready to move on? Yeah. Uh, we'll move on to our next segment of the show. You know this one. This is the one where we talk about uh, talk about magic decks that we played and, and what we did and what we learned playing them. It's a segment of the show called What Are We Playing? What are you playing, Brandon? I didn't play anything, but I am trying to get i'm gonna build i'm gonna get that ponza deck together that red green ponza deck yeah and uh i tried to do a little bit of research on it and there's not a whole lot of content out there about it a lot of everything for popper land destruction is still just in the mono black category yeah i think i'm i think i want to like reach out to conley woods and ask him to write an article about it oh wow be like write this article so i can say the things that you say because you're smarter than me hmm. but I, I i i know like deluxikov has been playing around with with kind of those colors but he I didn't don't know have... that i even know who that person is propaganda is the bald guy oh, Popper, propaganda okay i just didn't i guess lexikov i don't know deluxikov it's, it's, his ma off. it's his magic online name. I, oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. I haven't watched a lot of his videos or content, but I, I know of Popperganda. Okay. But, okay. So maybe I'll, I'll dig into that and see. But 
I don't know, because I feel like we we kind of both of us seem pretty unanimous that this deck was better than the mono black version. Yeah. So I really wanted to kind of do a little more research into it, and uh, I don't know, see if we were right, see if we were wrong, and try to start figuring the deck out, but. I'm probably going to try to go ahead and build it this week and then get some games in because it does look like a blast. What did you do, Sean, magic-wise? So right after last week's, not right after, it was the next day, instead of editing the podcast like I should have been, I decided to record a, a league playing an Emerge deck. I finally, I, I only record videos after I feel like they're presentable. I don't feel like I'm the star of the show. I feel like the deck is always the star of the show, and I want to present it. So I'm, I'm basically presenting my findings in this new archetype or whatever that I'm doing. And I, I finally got to the point where I felt like it was presentable, and I recorded the video, and I, it's, I love the deck. A lot of people had a lot of great feedback. Um, a lot of people were saying, well, just go mono blue which is probably the right decision, but I refuse to make it because I love Sky Shroud Cutter. I love letting my opponent gain five life at the cost of a 2-2. Two -two. Mm, that's so good. And then, yeah. Other than that, uh, I watched any new province play a janky lands brew, and so I had to make my own janky lands brew. I already had one like in the works, but he was using... Oboro Skycaller? Or I think it's... Yeah, I think it's Oboro Skycaller. You can pay two, return a land to your hand to untap a land. And it kind of just captured my imagination. And I brewed a deck, and it's so janky. That one I'm nowhere near presenting, but I'll keep you posted. Sounds janky. It is. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you, you'd make a good chef. Why? Well, because the food isn't about the chef. The food is the star, uh, not the chef. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, it always frustrates me when like chefs are like, "I have a Michelin star." No, you don't. The restaurant you're a chef in has a Michelin star. That's like, yeah, you know, yeah. You're the head chef. You're the boss of the show. But like, the star isn't awarded to you. It's awarded to your restaurant. Like. Hmm. You know, and so like then you get chefs like put gold leaf flaking on their food and make it all pompous, and they're like, "Look at what I made!" Shut up. <laughs> I just don't like pompous chefs. I mean, it is the the kind of the point of the deck is to play a wind zendicon to make a man land, put a Verdian longbow creature on it, creature land. Yeah, creature land, and then put a longbow on it, and then just untap and a go whole bunch. Off. Yeah, with, like, Kyrian Ranger, and that'll borrow a sky <laughs> color. Like, I've activated it, like, six times in a turn. It's just, yeah. like, it takes, like, nine turns to get it going, which is really good. Yeah, and, and then, what, I don't know, does the deck have a lot of good ways of, like, so, like, the the, the Legacy Lands deck. Yeah. Because I, I imagine these decks are sort of functioning in the similar vein of, like, they want to try to lock down the board in some manner before assembling their endgame combo. Um, the difference here being that like legacy lands has access to like tabernacle. Yeah. So what does this lands deck do in popper to get them to that point where they can assemble their win condition? Uh, I would say mostly blocking gaining life so that you don't care about how much tax your opponents are doing. <laughs> and then there's blocking with lands like colony gardens. Don't get ahead of yourself. That's pretty good. Uh, and then, uh, what's it called? There's like a, a tapped land, tapped blue land, that you can tutor up with crop rotation that says like target creature doesn't untap on its next untap step. And just oh, re yeah. recurring that enough mm -hmm. is almost impossible to actually lock down your opponent. <laughs> Are there any like uh, moments pieces and stuff? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's bad. Oh. Anyway, are we ready to move on to Card of the Week? Yeah! Card of the Week! So, our Card of the Week, we chose to talk about Stonehorn Dignitary. 
Uh, Stonehorde Dignitary is a three and a white for a one four rhino soldier. Um, he has an ETB that says uh, your opponent skips the next combat phase. So we kind of, I, we wanted to talk about this because one of the decks that made top eight of the most recent challenge was a Marasa Tron deck that had four copies of Stonehorn Dignitary. Um, so they're playing four copies of Stonehorn Dignitary alongside two copies of Moments Peace. And Stonehorn Dignitary is typically more common in like blue white Tron decks, not the Marasa Tron decks. Maybe let's just start and let's talk about. I guess let's just talk about why this card is good, what it does. Uh, it's it's basically a flicker target. Uh, you, you just want to make them. It's basically more moments pieces. Every time you flicker it or when it enters, you're just mitigating damage so that you can build up to where you're gonna like rolling thunder or something. And it, this stacks because it's like the next combat phase. Uh, one of the stacks goes off. It's like it enters the effects area or whatever when you play it. The ability does. So, there, so there'll be like four abilities in the effects area. They hit their next combat phase. One of them triggers. Oh, wow. Yeah, but it's... So it's they a, don't all trigger one time then. So I can I can cast two stone horns in one turn, and then my opponent skips two combat steps. Yes. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, it, it's it's a super unique effect for Popper. Like, we don't yeah. get things like this, except for this one card. And we really pay for it on the power. Like, the, it being yeah. a one for. But I think that that's okay, right? Absolutely, yeah. Like, I don't know that we're super worried about this guy attacking, because it's serving its purpose, which is gum up the ground like it's for toughness which i think is one of the most relevant things about the card yeah. um and then it it just is more moments pieces to get you to like you said your big rolling thunder or whatever you're going to do to kill your opponent so yeah it dodges bolt so it's a little tiny tiny bit safer to ghostly flicker it because your your wall and your rhino both have four toughness there's yeah, a lot and of things that do four damage in this format, but not a lot that do it at instant speed, though. Besides Scred, right? Uh, yeah, it's Scred. Like, and then... um, I guess Fire Blast. Is Fire Blast instant. is the other one, and that's yeah. basically the two. But that's a but lot that, of the burn but spells. But those in the two format. cards are fairly easy to play around. And yeah, I'll be honest. If I'm playing against Burn, and they're using their Fire Blast to kill my Stonehorn Dignitary, Dignitary. Yeah, I think I'm okay with that exchange. Yeah, mono red, uh, <clears throat> I think is the one that you're gonna do that the most in. Since in just burn your combat step doesn't matter. You just do it with yeah. instants and sorceries. Yeah, um, right. So it would really just be the uh, the red deck wins that's trying to do that to you. So the very biggest, narrow situations where this guy can actually die. The biggest problem I have with this card is. It's basically you're swapping out Stonehorn Dignitary for your Dinrova Horror. And mm -hmm. I think the power on Dinrova Horror is just so much far higher. ahead. Yes, much higher than this card. So the deck that we were looking at that had this card has Stonehorn alongside two copies of Moments Piece. What, what happens if you just cut the Moments Piece, play, you know, two Stonehorn Dignitaries, and then still play your Dinrova Horrors? Do you think they need uh, the moments piece? What, I think I mean, they do. Yeah. It's it's kind of hard to get the the flicker combo online. So I think but it's like, just reducing that you've they've reduced the number of moments pieces that they play. Yeah. But cutting them I think is a bad call because of those early turns. Yeah, you just think it's easier to go off with moments piece and and mnemonic wall. And there's than Stoneheart Dignitary cuz like Stoneheart Dignitary also gets brought back by Pulse of Marasa. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it, you can't, like, mystical teachings for it, and there's some turns when you're like, well, I would rather play a five or six mana spell with most of my mana and then leave up two rather than a four CMC spell. And, like, it just makes the math different to have both options. I think really it's just that it can be targeted with moments piece or t tutored with moments piece. Mystical teachings, I mean. 
<laughs> and yeah, definitely play both. Okay. But you think that, uh, but you still just kind of think that probably don't play Stonehorn, just play Moments Piece and play Dinrova Horrors instead? That's what I would do, but I think this is a little bit forced to kind of be unique. Okay. Do you I think it's like a meta decision? Like, I can't figure out the meta decision that would provoke this. Like, is is this really better? I don't think this is any better against the top three decks. Is it? Like, maybe it has a higher CMC, so it's, you can't spell stutter it, but... Yeah, I'm kind of it's hard there. to... Uh, um, I mean, Boros Monarch, like, probably can never deal with this, but uh, that's usually a good matchup for Mar Marasa Tron. I, yeah, I so, think so. I'm not, I'm not sure what this adds to the archetype. Hmm. I could be wrong. Like, we could just shift gears because Tron has taken such a beating over the past few months in numbers. Like, we've really seen them go from, like, number five slot, number seven slot, and just eight slot. Just, like, they've been going down. Mm -hmm. And maybe we just need a reworking of the deck and Dignitary ends up being it for reasons I haven't I haven't played against this deck a whole lot. I've seen like videos of it and things like that. It's it's just hard to tell. Yeah. I'm kind of curious about it too. Um so I don't know if you listening have some good ideas, uh email us on the show and let us know what you think. But either way, I think it's a I think this is an interesting change and I'm curious to see if decks move towards that going forward yeah and it'd be i'm also curious to try to figure out what the thinking behind the change was mm. all right uh so that was our card of the week uh stone horn dignitary and let's move into our main topic what is our main topic brandon our main topic is all the things you can't do with the colors you want to play with this was a really hard topic to write show notes for uh, yeah like writing about things that aren't there it's there's kind of no end to it and no there's kind of a structure to it that i had to make up because i don't know like writing about the absence of things i i had to look at what the other colors could do and then see if they could do it i yeah. don't know but the thinking behind this show was um, primarily for deck building and then also like if you're playing against a deck you're unfamiliar with, like a brew, knowing kind of what you have to th play around because they might be playing any number of cards. Yeah. Yeah. And since this is sort of... This is one of the... This is the format where you're going to play against the most brews. Oh, definitely. You know, of any other format, this is the format where, um, and I, may, I think less so now that Popper is becoming more mainstream, I want to say, you know, where you're getting a lot more players that are like playing tier decks. And so yeah. I think that the brewing is kind of getting pushed out a little bit, but it's still there and it's still very prevalent. And you're still going to play against decks all the time in leagues and stuff that you just have no clue what they're doing and so understanding the the limitations of each color can help you not play around things that you don't need to play around like nothing would be worse than playing against a black deck with you know you've got a bunch of three threes and you don't want to overextend into a wrath yeah well if you're all three three toughness creatures you don't need to worry about that yeah and you know there's there's like pestilence and things but like you can, you can. We'll, we'll we'll get into it. We'll get into it. Right? Yeah, we'll get into it. But anyway, so um, do we want to talk about your key? Your what you kind of did to try to. Yeah, I'll I'll uh, just go into whatever. this briefly. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I have these are these are the points that I evaluated all the colors on, and I'm only talking about what they are lacking. Uh, we have removal, life gain, artifact hate enchantment hate evasion card advantage 
evasion again because I wrote her twice for some reason, and protection. Evasion is double important. It when... really is. Flying is like the most important keyword in this format. Why don't you delete it? Now it's only not double important. Because <laughs> I'm. All right. Disregard everything we just said. Evasion is not as important as we said it is. Because Sean to... deleted the second evasion from his list. Are we ready to get into white? I guess so. So, white, its biggest limitation is the removal. There's not a lot of great removal in white. Um, our best removal spell is Journey into Nowhere. And then Sunlance, which is just a sorcery speed lightning bolt that only hits creatures. Uh, yeah, it only hits creatures, and it, they can't be white creatures. So Oh, not yeah, three damage to non-white creature at sorcery speed. So it's more of a sideboard card, unless you're just fine losing to Boros Monarch, or you have an amazing Boros Monarch matchup to begin with. Mm -hmm. And that any white deck I've played, that's typically not the case. Usually playing against tons of removal and flyers is really tough. Um, what's the other... There's one I... Uh, Exile, and he's... he's he has a hybrid manas. He's looking into a mirror, and he's like, "Oh no, I'm a Kithkin." Oh, I know the card you're talking about. It's adorable. The card is Unmake. So, long story short, we've basically got like three decent removal spells in white, and they're kind of conditional. Journey to Nowhere is not very conditional, is it? It's conditional on them. Not having not enchantment destruction, enchantment yeah. Okay. Like it, it's it's got drawbacks. All of them have drawbacks. Some are yeah, like conditional. And, and, and Journey into Norway is sorcery speed, and Sunlands is sorcery speed. Unmake is like the only good instant speed removal spell, and that one has probably the biggest drawback of all in that it costs white, white, white. Yeah. So it's not only three mana, but it's specifically three white mana. So you're not. You're not splashing this in any deck. You're playing this in mono white decks. Yeah, and it's it's de incentivizing you. That's a word to play like any spicy uh, colorless lands, which that's a that's another deck building cost. Yeah, I'm gonna retract my former statement. Hmm. You're only splashing unmake in black white decks because it's hybrid black white black white black white, right? Yeah. You're not really, yeah. That's not really a yeah, splash you're not, at that not, point. Yeah, it's not really a splash. It's just like my black white deck plays unmake. I figured I needed to like actually clarify that before we get some nerd at home. Yeah. Just like I'm gonna write them an email. <laughs> <laughs> actually, unmake. Um, okay, but yeah, but you can play this at... in black decks. You can play this in white decks, and you can play this in black white decks. The thing is, we look at black white decks, and they don't play unmake. They just play a better black they removal play, spell. Yeah, Pestilence. Yeah, right? Doomblade, Chainer's yeah, better, yeah, better better black removal spells. So what are some other um, disadvantages of white? They have to play small creatures. Uh, they There's know, just not a lot of big, big guys in the format, right? Yeah, like the biggest big guys have guys. like two... They have two power. That's yeah. Any playable white creature doesn't white really boy have more. White can't jump. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you'll see a lot of white decks. A lot of a lot of the white white decks they focus on swarming with tokens, um, and then pumping those up. Yeah. Usually one or the other. Like usually it's like an anthem effect or it's like enchantment based, like you know, heroic or boggles. Yeah, well that's what I mean by pump them up. It's yeah. like an anthem or or something. But yeah, it goes kind of both ways. Like heroic focuses on making a big battle cruiser and a lot of other white decks just try to make their battle screeches and their triplicate spirits and then cast an anthem of some kind. And that's definitely why we don't see, other than that one Tron list, really any blue-white decks is because they both have tiny creatures and are completely lacking removal. Not completely, but 
lacking any really good substantial removal, so it makes it really hard to play those colors together. Yeah, they've got to just really play... They've got to play either, you know, a really aggressive game, you know, or just have just a really powerful... I guess that's still aggressive. Like, Heroic is just an aggressive game. Oh, definitely. It's just a different... It's just a different... You know, it's different than, like... I don't know. I think a lot of times we think about aggressive, and I'm thinking about they curved out a one-drop, a two-drop, a three-drop, and, and that. But you do that in Heroic, you just do it on one creature. But... Yeah, so you'll see a lot of the white decks be a lot more aggressive. And Boros Monarch is kind of the exception and not the rule. Because that game can be gr that deck can be grindy. It's also not a mono white deck. It's getting some help from red. The last point I have here is the only card advantage you're getting out of white is generating tokens and getting advantage off of those tokens. And yeah. that's even hard a lot of the time. Like, you'll get advantage uh, when they try to remove your creatures. Thraben Inspector. Okay, well... Ish. And yeah. then, like, bouncing your Thraben Inspector and casting it again. That's, like, the best white does. Yeah, you've, you've gotten a guy and you've drawn a card. And, like, that's... Boros Mark is playing, like, every white card advantage spell there is. And there's, like, three, and you have to play artifacts with them. Yep. So, yeah, deck building to play these good cards is really restricted because they come with restrictions. Yeah, I want to say th those things in that there's no great payoff spells in white other than maybe it's enchantments is why we don't see a lot of white in our format. I want to say it's the weakest color we have. Yeah, I agree. I was going to say... Uh, to transition, I was going to say white sucks. Let's talk about blue. Okay, let's talk about blue. That was going to be my transition, and now <laughs> I've transitioned. So let's talk about blue. So blue also doesn't have any removal, like we just talked blue about. Blue sucks. Let's talk about black. <laughs> blue does not suck. It oh. has, other than black, it has the shortest list of negatives, and they're all caveated with counterspell exists. <laughs> Yeah, it's really easy to, when you're building a blue deck, to, to okay, how am, I'm weak to this, I'm weak to this, I'm weak to this. I guess I'll just play more counter spells. Or I'm really weak to this, so I guess I'll play a Deprive too. Yeah, and just, I have to play such that I don't tap like, out every yeah, turn. Or I'm going to lose to an artifact deck, so I'll put three annuls in my sideboard instead of two. Yeah, it's... Blue's dumb. It's bad at... Broken killing anything on the stack but once it's resolved it has a lot harder time yeah that's that's the that's the downfall right of a counter spell doesn't do anything to affect the board so it's it makes the the lines of play tricky like all of these things play into really blue not dealing with things on the board very well uh it has no life gain I can't think of, yeah, there, there's, there's usually there's exceptions to these rules of, like, you get to pay more mana or there's some kind of drawback. Blue just flat doesn't get life gain. So once those spells are resolved, it it has to figure something out, like bouncing something, which is card disadvantage. It can make up yeah. for it later because it does have plenty of advantage, but going under a blue deck is usually the best way to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And that's just because if you can go wide and under, they don't have a lot of answers for you. Um, Augur of Bullis has really shorn that up and just mm -hmm. being able to make a good big blocker on the ground. But Battle Screech, like that's an incredibly difficult card for Blue to deal with on its own. And Blue's best answer to this is Echoing Truth. Mm -hmm. But... It, that that's also reliant on your opponent going wide with a single card name, right? Like, you know, if they made a, my opponent's got a Glint Hawk, a Core Sky Fisher, and two Battle Screech tokens. You know, I that's incredibly hard to deal with that board. Yeah, you, like you've countered the first Battle Screech because it's so bad for you, and then they just flashed it back with those creatures that were already on board. <laughs> Let's talk about black. Black's 
biggest weakness, biggest downfall, is it does not have any artifact or enchantment removal at all. None. Zero, except for one. And that's not even good. It's uh, Divest that was just recently printed in Dominaria. Yeah. And so... But it has a really obvious way of making up for both of those things. It just kills the artifact creatures once they resolve, or mm -hmm. edicts the thing yeah. that has enchantments the on enchantment. it. The enchantment. Yeah, so... Uh, and there's not a lot of enchantments or artifacts in this format that affect black decks that are really relevant, you know? It's not like... Or that they can't deal with because you, you put it on a creature and I just removed your creature or you your artifact just happened to be a big creature that I doombladed. Mm -hmm. So it's actually really not that big of a downfall if you think about it. Yeah. And like... It's sort of like black is sort of like getting the... They're getting their cake and they're eating it too. It's like, oh, I'm going to be bad... I have no way to kill artifacts. Oh, the only relevant artifacts are also creatures that I can kill? Yeah. All right, I'll live with that. Yeah, that so can it's be not going to, like, blow up all their lands or something like most of the other colors can do besides blue. Um, but to to kind of yeah. even this out, it has a high color weight. And if you're not familiar with color weight, it's the number of colored symbols in the cost of a card. It's like, if you think to the kind of cards that black plays, it's... You know, Chittering Rats, Geth's Verdict, uh, Kumbaj, which is... They're, they're all just black symbols all over the place, so it makes it hard to splash. So going black can shore up a lot of the weaknesses your deck has, because it can kind of deal with everything. Is Chittering Rats the Sweeper Rat? No, Crypt Rats is the Sweeper Rat. Yeah, Chittering Rats is the yeah, Rat. Yeah, it's just one black black. Yeah. Yeah, and black is really I, the color Crypt, that... Crypt Rats falls into this because you yeah. can only spend black mana on its effect, right? Yeah, it's really the only thing with uh, board wipes. We've got Evancar's Justice, Crypt Rats, and Pestilence. But mm -hmm. those, you can only play, put black mana into it, so it doesn't see as much play because you have to go really all in on it. Yeah. It's really hard to splash in other colors and and that's sort of why we see a lot of mono black decks. Or you see black being the splash color, not the dominant color. Yeah, I I plan on going to uh, GP Vegas and playing as many pauper side events wow. as possible. High roller over here. <laughs> and the the deck I plan on playing is that pestilence control deck, that corrupt mm. control deck, because I just feel like it has the best matchups across the board. I don't have to worry about a certain kind of deck just beating me out of the game. It just has kind of all of the answers it needs. While not having as great of a sideboard or hosers, the main deck just has those. I think that black is probably... I don't want to say on par, but it's really close to on par with blue. Blue mm -hmm. having counterspell sends it over the top, but... Mm -hmm. Black really is just a solid color in this format. It's got a lot of answers. Like we've touched on, its weaknesses really aren't that weak because it, though there's also just like nothing that exploits those weaknesses. Yeah, and like what kind of hate cards are you playing against Black? Like, right, you've got like uh, graveyard hate, <clears throat> and you can build your deck such that you you only have to worry about I don't know two cards that you have four ofs of and you can sideboard those out if you have to but usually they're just good anyway yeah so well black doesn't suck let's talk about red red has a lot of negatives but i think that's from it being really focused on what it wants to do red cards are basically all red cards look the same uh, they have, they have little evasion. <sighs> they make up for that in speed and kind of just hoarding out if they if they're going for that strategy. And then they have falter effects, but those can be kind of expensive. And it's not really true evasion where, like flying will, 
just a creature have flying will ignore everything on the ground. You're paying for something, for one thing to not be able to block, and you still have to, like, if the board is gummed up, you, you're still going to have to deal with most of it. They have Menace, which, that is evasion, but there's very few playable Menace cards, and they usually have kind of a low impact. The red really pays for its evasion. Yeah, but like you did say, it makes up for that in speed. And so when I think about a, like the red deck wins curving out, and at the top of their curve, they're playing Goblin Heel Cutter, that's incredibly devastating when you're thinking like, as the opposite player, how am I going to get them dead and then keep myself alive? And then you've got to think like, okay, well, I can have X blockers and still be fine, so I'm going to attack with this creature. But then you got to stop and think, well, what if they heel cutter me? Mm -hmm. You know? And so it, it makes it, the speed of, of these decks and how aggressive they can be sort of really help boost up these falter effects, these um, almost tempo plays. Yeah. They just make your opponents have to choose, you know, like, how much do I have to play around Goblin Heel Cutter? Like, I need to prioritize my removal spell because if he plays a creature with Menace, I need to be able to kill that. And so I can just, I need to try to block with my guys on the ground when I can and trade with his other creatures. And it just, it just makes a, it makes it difficult. And then they also play a sub game where they have reach in their burn spells. Yeah. To try to like get those last few points of damage in. And those are highly evasive. It's very hard to block a burn spell. Yeah, you have to probably use a counter spell, right? Probably. That's what I would do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <clears throat> One point for me. I'm going to redeem a common knowledge point right now. Uh, answer small. Wow! There's some common knowledge for you guys. All right, let's continue the episode. <laughs> and I, I had... I had first strike written on here, but that is definitely not evasion. It's kind of just a combat no. trick. You you are your creature is blocked. Maybe it won't get blocked next time. Yeah. So uh, the next thing I have here is there's pretty much no card advantage in red. They've <laughs> the best things you can do in red for card advantage are like play a couple of like a. Uh, a hordling outburst and make multiple one ones, or yeah, it's it's very similar to white. Uh, do they a get... burn spell that does damage to all creatures, and you mm -hmm. get a two for one or a three for one that way. Yeah. So where red does make up its card advantage, and we're going to go back to the big strength of red again, which is speed, mm -hmm. is when you kill your opponent as quickly as red deck can, and they still have like four cards or whatever in their hand. You've, you've made your opponent mulligan, right? Because that's just four cards that they didn't get to play. Yeah. And you played all your cards and they didn't. Again, that's, you know, and we'll, we'll kind of notice this the more we talk about it, but each color, even though it has a weakness, the strength of that color seems to complement that weakness. And for red, the speed of it sort of helps shores up all these things that are bad. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, they still have no way of outright beating card advantage outside of making a swarm of creatures. Like, if I can make a, a portling outburst and trade each of my 1-1 one, one goblins with one of your Fairies. X-1 creatures, yeah. yeah, that's a 3 for 1. That's not very common, but... Yeah, it's super it's, hard. Yeah. So. Uh, the next one we have here is there's no life gain. Yeah, they, I like to gain life, so I don't like red. You like to gain life? I, yeah. yeah, I'm totally what on the life gain trade. Does that make me a Timmy, a Johnny? I don't know the, what those I don't words know mean either. anymore. I just know that spikes are competitive, and yeah. Timmy's and Johnny's do things. Yeah, that's where I'm at on those. <laughs> but yeah, I like to gain life. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, the most life gain I've seen a red deck do is like playing a Sylvic Life Staff and then sacking a bunch of goblins. And they're, they're going deeper into card disadvantage yeah, just to make up for just their shortcoming. Okay. Uh, um, also, no enchantment removal for red cards. 
Um, and there are enchantments in this format that are relevant. Yeah, Circle of Protection Red, Red is definitely an yeah. enchantment. I'm even thinking of, you know, any uh, any enchantment that just gives a creature a lifelink and buffs it outside of a burn spell. Because that's the other big weakness of burn decks. All their removal is damage-based. Yeah, and, like, Hexproof creatures kind of, uh, like, all their removal is damage-based, so they have to target those creatures. The, so, the... I would have to infer from this list that Burn has a bad Boggles matchup. Yes. Uh, I, I wanted to build a red control deck. I faced Brandon with this. And the way I was overcoming things like this is, like, play, is it Martyr of Ashes? Like, yeah, screw that card. It does, it does <laughs> damage to all non-flyers for every red card you reveal. I don't want to listen to you anymore. It's it's such a high cost, and it's so conditional on you having a, like a certain amount of uh, red cards in your hand and things like that, and like the mana yeah. to use it. That... The other one that was annoying is the Undying one. Huh? The Undying one? The one with Undying? Oh. Yeah, that card was also very annoying. Yeah, the, the Pinger. Yeah. Like, I, that deck is built around the worst thing red is at, and it's trying to eke out card advantage. And the deck kind of just doesn't work because red's just so bad at that. Um, it seemed to work great in our games. It's, it's making its way downtown. You, you, fast. you won, like, all the games, and Faces I rage passing, quit. And I'm homebound. da 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 da, -da. <laughs> <laughs> you know I'd walk a thousand miles I just love you tonight Stop it <laughs> Red sucks, let's talk about green No, we're not done with red yet We had more to talk about, didn't we? Uh, Just no protection for its creatures Yeah, your creatures just die But they serve their purpose, right? You're like, get in there, hit him for two You die? Yes Card advantage. I dealt two damage and got a card out of your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Red sucks. Let's talk about green. Um, green is in a very similar vein to a lot of these other colors. Is they have awful removal. Yeah. Their it's only real yeah. Their only good removal spell is Dragon Punch. Mm -hmm. Epic confrontation. Give your creature plus one plus two. Yeah. And make it fight another creature. At instant speed? No, it's um, not sorcery speed. Sorcery speed? Yeah. Good golly, Miss Molly. Yeah. There's fight spells that are instant speed, but they don't give those pluses. And if yeah, you're going to be you risking your creature... Really need those those yeah. buffs. Because, like, I, uh, my guy fights your guy, and then my guy dies in the process. That's a, that's a two for one, but not in your favor, buddy. So you want to get those buffs, because, you know, you don't want to be two for one in yourself, but... Um, they also just have very little card advantage. Um, Bleed the Stampede is the best uh, car source of card advantage, and even Lead the Stampede is conditional. You can get unlucky and whiff on it, or you can just like pick up one card with it or something. That's not very common in the decks that are built for Lead the Stampede, but it's possible. Yeah, they've they're decks that work with that high deck building cost of fill your deck with as many creatures as possible like elves and slivers are like it yeah the other thing that green can do if you want to try to create a card advantage of some sort is you just get a lot of lands there That's... are lots of ways in green to get lands out of your deck and into your hand or onto the battlefield yeah like uh yavamaya elder i think is the greatest card advantage card in green you can you can like block with it, sack it, draw a card, and then tutor up two lands. But they yeah. end up being lands, and you have all these cards in your hand. It doesn't matter if they're just basic. Well, lands. I mean, that's like what gush is, right? Yeah. Anytime you gush, you always just have four more lands than you did before. <laughs> You're just drawing all islands. <laughs> that's what it feels like. It really even does. if you only even if you draw like spell land, you're like, oh I got three lands in my hand now. <laughs> oh. 
they also green also is one of those colors that really struggles with evasion as well it relies on beefy guys on the ground um and sometimes you can get you know trample or something like that but you know there's not a lot of powerful things that fly um i can't really think of any good green flyers off the top of my head good ones no there's yeah any. yeah good ones like that are worth playing there's pseudo flying like silhana ledge <laughs> yeah yeah and it's I, really I the still, exception yeah i still try to not think about that card whenever i can but it 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 distinctly doesn't have flying and that's a lot yeah, worse because it, it can't has, block it has can only be blocked by creatures with flying which right it still leaves the green really weak to flyers and you can say like yeah green has reach but they that, have plummet they, and have, my number they do have sideboard cards like aerial volley and uh scattershot archer they can deal yeah. with flyers but the fact that when they're dealing with flyers they don't also have flying like a lot of the other colors mm -hmm. is a huge drawback like putting a Oh, what's it called penumbra spider in your deck yeah you've shut down their flyers and it's going to get you some card advantage by it's probably also just shut down the ground too it's a yeah. two foe <laughs> it'll it, it really shuts down uh it blocks really well it just sort of closes but... the board down it's just like a it's like a i don't know it's the trump wall <laughs> just says nothing passes Oh, except for, I don't know. That's probably not a good analogy because it's probably not hard to get over a wall. But Penumbra Spider is hard to get through. So it's better than Donald Trump's wall. Yeah. The, the problem with walls is they don't attack. Yeah. Yeah, Penumbra Spider can attack. Take that, Trump. It we got can, Penumbra but it Spider doesn't. I've seen... I've, it, it can attack, but it just doesn't. Right, it doesn't need to. It just sits there like a big scary spider that you're like... Do I want to mess with this guy? No, I'm going to back off. And the spider's like, yeah. It doesn't, you say it doesn't need to, but if Penumbra Spider just had flying, you bet your butt that thing would be attacking way more often than it does. Oh, 100%. Yeah. See, the problem with, though, is that Penumbra Spider has the four toughness, but it doesn't have three power. Yeah. And so I can attack my two four into their one three and then take a hit from their flyers yeah right like the trample is definitely the main way that they're evading and like it disincentivizes mm -hmm. blocks because you're just treating that your toughness for life total yeah. right so maybe you're going to get through a little bit more that way but you're still giving them the option which makes it really hard to play green yeah and what and what green kind of does to make up for this is it just typically just has bigger creatures right yeah less, and they're sort less of, so they're in popper yeah that is true less so in popper i guess the best green deck is really a swarm deck but it makes a big creature so like if you can sneak an elephant guide onto almost any of your creatures and turn it into a five five you're creating you're not creating evasion but you're creating you're you're making a one-sided abyss right you have a creature you have a card that's extremely difficult to deal with that's just going to eat your opponent's creature every turn yeah or they're going to take a hit for five and and that's sort of where green makes up for for all of this is it just makes it can make bigger things and it's weird though because in the case of stompy it can just go wider too yeah, that's definitely how it makes up in the card advantage aspect yeah. of just presenting a threat that they have to throw card advantage into. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, they have to throw in the one ones that were supposed to be their advantage, but now green just ate them, so they're back where they started. Yeah, and and elves is the same dynamic of just going wide. Elves sort of has some interesting forms of advantage and invasion, though. It kind of they breaks a gain. lot of the green rules. It does, yeah. Elves, elves breaks all the rules, I think. Right, like it, it can gain a but a bunch of life. Um, you know, it makes a big creatures. It can well, mow down. 
one of the coolest things about like it elves brings this up is uh timber watch elf pumps the creature that they're not blocking so that's yep. a form of evasion as well of just yeah getting and, in and they do one guy i'm not crazy they have an elf that can give minus x minus x right no no am i just thinking of timber watch elves yeah it's just a plus be. x plus x to one of your creatures they have longbow. For some reason, I thought they had something that could kill creatures. Maybe it's just they put a longbow on something, and that's how they do it. Yeah, or just. I guess it doesn't matter though, because you can. You can sort of do the same thing in the elf deck, where you make a huge elvish ranger, elvish, the one one that gets a plus one counter every time you cast vanguard. An elf. Vanguard. Yeah, you make a huge vanguard, and you just like attack and then they're like oh no you've got two five fives yeah that ah. i think that kind of speaks to if you can figure out a way to break the rule that constrains a color the most you're already going to be exceeding in all of the other aspects kind of passively so that's a good way to bust a deck or make it something playable that wouldn't otherwise be that's kind of what i'm thinking with that mono red card advantage deck is figure out a way to make this deck work and red will take yeah. care of the rest of the things that you're not so good at right exactly it's and if you working. look at all the decks in in the format they're all doing that they're all mitigating the weakness either by splashing a color that fills it in or by doing what else does just breaking those rules or like what uh borrow mono black decks do where they just don't they don't care about the things they can't answer. They just are so much more efficient at answering everything else. Yeah, and that's that's definitely what's coming up over and over is the, the decks that are good are they have an answer for the things their color is bad at. Like red not having reach, just they burn out their opponent. Uh, blue not having life gain, just don't let them get enough guys to outrace you. I think yeah, cast counterspell. White is definitely the, the weakest, the worst at doing that. It's shortcomings, mm -hmm. like only having small creatures. It, it, the way it it's... has to overcome that is putting those enchantments on a creature, and we all know yeah. what getting five for one to like that is like. Because and the, and the other the way that yeah, and the other way that it makes up for shortcomings, like we said, trying to go really wide mm -hmm. with its creatures. Electricery exists in this format, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, uh, blah, 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 What is that card? <sighs> Swirling Sandstorm. Swirling Sandstorm is another one. Not the one I was thinking of. Pestilence. Um, Pestilence is another one. Not the one I was thinking of. Heaven Cards Justice. Crypt Heaven Cards Justice is the one I was thinking of. Okay. But yeah, there's Crypt Rats. There's Heaven Cards Justice. Like, there's all these ways to deal with small creatures in mass. You know, even Black has... Echoing Decay. You made six Battle Screech tokens? Okay, they're gone. Uh, blue has... Uh, uh, not Echoing Decay. Yeah, Echoing Truth. And, and Truth, Blue... Blah. Yeah. Blue has Echoing Truth. Black has Echoing Decay. Like, there are just so many ways to deal with these creatures that... And the way... Blue's strength to make up for its lack of... Or its weaknesses is really a weakness in this format. And the way white is making up for those spells specifically is like veteran armor and luma thread field one luma thread field isn't that good and two veteran armor dies when you sneeze on it yeah he's got that achilles heel so green sucks uh green let's, sucks. let's talk about multicolor very briefly okay uh so definitely mixing the colors you have to take into account what you want to do. Like, you definitely need a plan. I need to start over. Do we even want to talk about multicolor? I do, really briefly. Okay. I'm just going to mute myself and let you. Okay. So green sucks. Let's. I'm, I want to talk about multicolor really That's briefly. That's my line. 
mean, let's not talk about multicolor. Oh, okay. Um, so most of the time when I'm brewing a deck, I find that this plan that I'm going for is all one color. And then you just kind of have to pick a color that complements that. And I do recommend going like two colors. I think, wasn't it at the inception of Magic, uh, Richard Garfield was like, people are mostly going to play one color. That's why we can put all of these broken things in the different colors because going multicolor is going to be hard. And then people just put all the best. Yeah. They just put all the best crap in all their decks. Yeah, because they had dual lands. So there's definitely... Yeah, Rosewater a... really screwed the pooch on that one. <laughs> not Rosewater, Garfield. Garfield. But I'm still not... Just blame Worth. <laughs> so definitely power in going multicolor. Consider where you're, you're falling short. Instead of choosing a color that synergizes and does the same thing as your color, kind of choose one that does the opposite is what I would say. Um, like some really weak color combinations that I've noticed is mostly blue green. Blue green has such a hard time in this format. It has no creature kill. Anything yeah. that resolves is kind of just a, an emergency. Well, yeah, all their they have very similar weaknesses, mm-hmm. and their strengths don't complement each other that well. You're right. Yeah. So it's really hard to find a cohesive deck within these this color color pair um white white is the the master of nothing expert or master of or john it's the master of nothing yeah and also jack of all trades no i wouldn't say it's the jack of all trades and the master of none i would just say it's not good at anything (laughs) (laughs) that's not true (laughs) so i find myself splashing white more like less frequently than any other color by far because it's not making up any of my my outside of black white has the only unconditional removal spells which is a thing but not a lot of them no but if it's your secondary color and all you need are some removal to shore up you know your bad matchups you just throw some journey to nowheres into your deck yeah and that's like the one card that is really pulling you into white um yeah i didn't have much to talk about multicolor though uh, do you want to move on? Yeah, multicolor sucks. Let's talk about uh, Phyrexian mana because that doesn't suck. Yeah, Phyrexian mana is great. It's it's broken. I don't know if great is the way I would describe it. Beyond. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that it falls into the camp of like if it didn't exist, magic might be better. A, a more consistent but... magic is a better magic in my book but it does kind of like poop all over the color pie yeah it it poops on the color pie but it also i don't know i mean maybe it's not frixie man in general maybe it's just some of those really big offenders like jataxian probe but we don't really have to worry about that in this format so frixie man is actually great in popper now that i think about it oh yeah thinking about all the shortcomings that popper has Phyrexian mana is actually sort of a godsend. Oh, definitely. It's our, it's our savior. Um, the like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna talk about the most, the one I, I'm always the most excited about, and that's Vault Scourge. Uh, flying, I still think is the most relevant ability in Popper. And has like, Life Link. And Life Link. So, and it costs one mana. Uh, that's just too many things. Vault Scourge is amazing. Uh, if you look at the colors, a lot of them just don't have flying in it. Vault Scourge gives them access to that. Like both mm-hmm. red and green don't have access to flyers or lifelink. Or green has more access to lifelink and like pulse of Marasa and like yeah. life gaining effects. Right. But when it just wants that on an evasive creature, Vault Scourge just yep. comes down from the Phyrexian heavens and blesses us. <gasps> Uh, the other the other big one that I think of when I when I think when I think Phyrexian mana in this format, I'm immediately drawn to mutagenic growth. Yeah. Like that's like the first card that comes into my mind. Um, I don't think we can underestimate enough the power of a free pump spell. Especially in this format. 
a format, a constructed format where combat tricks are viable, mm -hmm. we now have a free one that can go into any deck. So it's it's crazy because like you're playing against mono blue Delver, and you've got to have. Oh, they attack me with their Delver. I've got my Spire Golem. Can you even safely block? They're tapped out. Yeah, but they could mutagenic growth you. Mutagenic growth doubles as a kill spell. It doubles as a burn spell. Yeah, it's a it, it's it's everything. It it a lot of the time becomes exactly what you need it to be. Sometimes it doesn't find any and it's use. it's free! Yeah. I mean, it costs two life for you people at home that are going to try to correct me. But yeah, it's free. But yeah, blue, black, red, uh, they're all bad at protect protecting their creatures. And uh, Mutagenic blue. Growth does that very well in this format. Yeah, blue can protect its I won't. I don't want to say blue is necessarily bad at protecting its creatures, it would just rather use that protection on removing card advantage, like counter Mole Drifter, counter... Yeah, because its forms of protection are their catch-alls, their counter spells. But that's not really a good use of your counter spell, is saving your creature. Like, I don't want to trade my, my two-mana counter spell for your Lightning Bolt. Unless it's, like, attacking, you know, my Ninja of the Deep Hours, and I, you know... Like, there are situations, but for the most part, I think I would just rather... Mutagenic growth, my ninja the deep hours, and hit you for two extra damage. Yeah. Draw a card and eat your lightning bolt. Uh, the next one I wanted to oh, talk free. about for free. It's free. The next one is oh, free. Apostle's blessing. We just talked about how important evasion is, and this is a colorless evasion spell that's also a protection spell. I don't. I want to say it, over and over on these Frexian mana cards, the life doesn't matter. Yeah, life total does matter in Popper, but it's a lot easier to find life gain in your deck than in, like put life gain in your deck than find evasion and Apostle's blessing can protect your creature. I I love all of these Frexian mana cards. Have I told you that? Yeah. Well, an Apostle's <laughs> blessing is a removal spell. And just blocking? Yeah, they attack, I block, give my guy protection from your creature, your whatever color your creature is, and mm -hmm. I eat him in combat. And sometimes that sometimes happens where your opponent is thinking, I'm gonna make this attack here, and one for one with a couple of his creatures just to try to clear away the board or something, you know, or it allows you to make what seems like unprofitable attacks, and it makes your opponent think like well, what are they going to do? And it makes blocking wonky for them. It makes attacking hard for them if they know they you have Apostle's Blessing. These cards are good. The last one is Gut Shot. What shot? Gut Shot. Wow. Uh, it's removal for decks without removal. Uh, I've seen this in tons of sideboard. I recommend it if, you're, if your Fairies matchup is poor. You can just play Gut Shot for infinite tempo advantage and uh one for one in your opponent um so phyrexia mana is busted let's move on to artifacts so there's not a whole lot i i don't want to get so into artifacts because yeah. i could i mean the i'm big an artifacts one guy is... <laughs> i could go <laughs> talk big... about artifacts for a whole episode and we might the two, the two big things that we can get from splashing artifacts are removal and mana facing. There's, yeah. there's life gain. There's tons of life gain in artifacts. Is Bottle Gnomes a common? Bottle Gnomes is definitely a common. That card sucks. Pristine Talisman is a good common. I like, I like that card. Uh, Talisman. What's it called? Sil Silvok Lifestaff. We've got plenty of... You can yeah. make up the shortcomings in your deck by playing artifacts super easily. That's why I end up putting them in almost every brew I make, because the first thing I did when I got into magic was get good at artifacts, because that's always accessible no matter what deck you're playing. Yeah. And and it's very easy to just go, oh, man, I, I really need a way to answer something. Uh, I guess I'll just throw a couple serrated arrows into my deck. 
Yeah. You know? Like that red green Ponza list we looked at last week. It, it just needed needed something, so Conley threw two serrated arrows into the main deck. And it's it's definitely card advantage a lot of the time. Oh yeah. If you can if you can kill three of their creatures, and even if their creatures have more than one toughness, oftentimes putting one minus one minus one counter invalidates that creature. Yeah, all like the sudden, creature's not doing anything anymore in combat. An Augur of Bolas with a minus one minus one counter on it looks a lot less scary. I promise you. Yeah. And then the last thing is uh, the mana fixing. So you get uh, you get you get filter effects mostly out of um, out of the artifacts. You get you get a few like mana ramp in the form of like uh, signets if you're mm -hmm. into that. But for the most part, it's just I filter a generic mana into my prophetic prism, and I get back this mana. Yeah, there's there's always things like uh, Springleaf Drum, but you're a lot of the time you're paying a premium to have an artifact effect in your deck by paying a higher mana cost. Since everyone has access to it, they don't want to make it too accessible. But if you're fine playing that, paying that cost definitely look at artifacts there's even upside if your your color synergizes with artifacts which is most colors do blue is the best one at it because blue's the best <laughs> that was really sad <laughs> there was so much just defeat and disappointment basically every negative emotion in your face all at one time well that's because i haven't played blue until like part way through last year and then i was just like let's do it and it's really um, good you hate that it's so good yeah and i'm just gearing all of my decks to beat blue decks and they still lose because it's counter spell so long story short um all the colors suck so play some frexy mana cards and some artifacts in your deck right yeah, Is that the takeaway from today's show? Just build a deck out of artifacts and Phyrexian mana cards. Well, you can play some blue cards, no, no, too. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, blue sucks, though. Let's go to the outro. Yeah, this this topic sucks. The outro. No. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do actually hope that, that something in this was um, useful if you're thinking about how you're brewing your deck or you're trying to shore up bad matchups. The best way to uh, – got to start over. I have no idea where I'm going with this. What I want to try to say to you guys is you need to recognize your weaknesses before you can turn them into strengths. Yeah. Wow. That – you didn't even need a common knowledge point for that. I gave that to you for free <laughs> except for our patrons because they are – paying us money because they went to patreon.com slash common knowledge and they pledged some monies to us and as soon as me and sean figure out how to upload stuff to you guys we are going to start giving you content like no other so because we're thankful yeah so go to patreon.com slash common knowledge and whatever you want to give is probably a lot more than we deserve so thank you <laughs> If you want to email the show, you can do so at commonknowledgemtg at gmail.com. Uh, every time we get an email, we're going to try to read it. And uh, we like hearing your emails. It... Um, and they add value to the show, I think. I think that whenever we can get feedback from you guys to either, one, make the show better, or two, talk about something that you want to hear, it just makes the show better. Yeah, if, if you want to give back in any way and you're like, eh... Things are a little tight. I don't know if I can donate on Patreon. Just writing an email makes us mm -hmm. super happy. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's an awesome way to get back to the show because... That helps us Sean... generate content. If yeah, you have we're... a if you have a, a episode idea, give it to us. Yeah, we'll probably use it because uh, me and Sean are not a, 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 a knowledge pool of uh, show, show topic ideas. We have we have a few, but yeah, we sometimes grasp at straws. Yeah, to try to find topics, and so if you guys can tell us what you want to hear, 
I wish I we had an example to... of us grasping at straws for a show topic. <laughs> <laughs> this episode I almost did is this what whole, Sean's talking about. I almost did a whole episode on Gush. Instead? Yeah, that's what I was suggesting. I was like, let's just do it on Gush. Let's just talk about Gush. We'll just, we'll just get Steve Menendian's book and we'll just have story time with common knowledge. Heck and we'll, yeah. we'll take turns just reading passages out of Steve Menendian's book. Like, I, from this episode, I basically learned, like, if you're going to brew, sure up your worst aspect, which is, like, I don't know, maybe you brew, need to state the no-brainers before we can cover every magic topic ever, but... Yeah. Uh, oof. This one was, this one was sure some common this, knowledge, I want to say. This was some very common knowledge, but you know what? Maybe someone benefited from it. I, I actually feel like I learned a few things. I feel like it was better than we thought it was going to be. All right. Be positive. No. <laughs> Where can they well, find I you, Brandon? The show there, but I've still got to talk about stuff in our outro. Where can they find you, Brandon? Tweeter, the Tweeter verse. Oh, God, what's my Twitter handle? I got to read the show notes. At b clark underscore c k. And where can we find you, Shawnee boy? You can find me on Twitter at. Lobert8, that's L-O-B-B-E-R-T, number eight. Or you can find me on YouTube. Just type it in, uh, Lobert. Yep, remember those double Bs. L-O-B-B, B-B, B-B, B-B Sean. I think it's actually pronounced Lobert, and I just misspelled it. <clears throat> it's supposed to be Lobert. Bye, everybody! Wait, we're not done! What? We gotta, we gotta do one more shout out for our sponsor. Oh. Because they're our sponsor, and we love them. They're puremtgo.com. So, bye, everybody! <laughs> <laughs>